We're going to read from verse 1 through into chapter 2. Everyone there? Lovely. So Nehemiah chapter 1 uh, and through to 2 verse 3. Oh, and kids. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Forgot about this. So um, I want you to watch out, kids. Are you with me? We've got my kids. Uh, yeah, 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 you've got your attention. Um, so I want you to watch out and look for how does Nehemiah feel, all right, and what's going on with his face. Okay, so that's easy to remember, isn't it? How does he feel and what's going on with his face? Now, the answer to that is at the end of the reading, okay? So you've got to listen to the whole thing. You get to the end and you'll get the answer, okay? How does he feel and what's going on with his face? And so Nehemiah chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. The words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah, in the month of Kislev in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Hanani, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile and also about Jerusalem. They said to me, those who survived the exile are back in the province, are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Then I said, Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him, and keep his commandments. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's family, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly towards you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws you gave your servant Moses. Remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if your exiled people are at the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. They are your servants and your people, whom you redeemed by your great strength and your mighty hand. Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. I was cupbearer to the king. Now there's a scene change, isn't there? Uh, we move on, uh, chapter one, uh, 2, verse 1. In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was brought for him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. I had not been sad in his presence before, so the king asked me, why does your face look so sad when you are not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of heart. I was very much afraid, but I said to the king, May the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word, the Bible. We thank you that you have spoken and not left us in the dark. And Father, we pray that you would speak and reveal yourself to us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So, kids, uh, I want to know, um, how, 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 did, how did Nehemiah feel and what's going on with his face? Go on, Grace. He was sad. Yeah, he was sad, wasn't he? Yeah, he was sad. So what was happening with his face? I mean, was his face like this? No, it was more like that. Yeah, he's sad. He's really sad. Now, why was Nehemiah sad? Well, there's a couple of reasons why Nehemiah um, was sad. Um, the, the first reason, we might just go backwards, actually. Uh, the, the, the first reason is all about the walls. Did you notice it's talking about the walls of Jerusalem? He's sad about the walls. You see, God's people had been kicked out of God's place and God's city, Jerusalem. They'd been kicked out. And that happened a long time ago, and they'd been booted out. But they'd started coming back to Jerusalem. And when they came back, they found that it was a mess. 
It was a complete mess. The walls were all broken down. The gates had been burned by fire. The whole thing was a mess and it was all broken down. And Nehemiah is sad about that. We're going to think about that more through this term, this rebuilding of the, of the walls. But right now they're in a mess and he's sad about the walls. But Nehemiah is also sad about something else as well. The second thing, he's sad about God's people. Actually, this is the main thing that Nehemiah is sad about. He's sad about God's people. Uh, he's concerned, isn't he, about the state of God's people. I don't know if you noticed that. It's there in verse 2. If you want to uh, look with me, he questions those men. They come to him, don't they? And in verse 2, he says, I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile, the people, and also about Jerusalem, the place. Nehemiah is worked up and he's sad about God's people and the walls as well, but about God's people. And they answer him, don't they, in verse 3. It's the same again. They say, those who survive the exile are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. And then they answer, don't they, the wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. God's people are in trouble. And they're in disgrace, or as the English Standard Version puts it, shame. And Nehemiah is sad about the shameful state of God's people. Now, how do we know he's sad? Can anyone tell me? We've already answered the question a little bit, but can anyone tell me how do we know that Nehemiah is sad? There's a few clues in the passage. Any of the kids help me? We know his face looks sad. We know that. What what else is going on? Don't have to be kids. Come here, how do we know he's sad? Go on, Marin. Yes, yes, he prays and fasts, doesn't he? So verse 4, chapter 1, verse 4, uh, when he hears about all of this, he cries, doesn't he? says he wept, and he didn't just cry for a few minutes. He cr- this went on for days. Nehemiah cries, and as Marin said, he, he fasts. That means he stops eating for a while so that he can pray and focus on praying to God, crying out to God, and mourning, as it says as well. He's really upset about God's people and about the walls. Now, um, I've got a little building project uh, just sort of in development over here. I don't, um, can you all see it? You see it over there? This is my, this is my building project. Um, uh, what do you think of it? What do you make of it? I mean, give me sort of out of 10. What's going on, Grace? Oh, you see, Grace, I thought you're one of my greatest supporters. I thought you were, but no, go on. What do you think? Go on. Eight. Eight. Oh, eight. Eight's good. Eight's good. Yeah, that's not so bad. I, I, yeah, I think it's going down, isn't it? I think if we're honest about my building project, it's not that good, is it? I mean, there's not a lot of... Well, I don't know what's going on, but there's some bits and pieces there, aren't there? It's a little bit like those walls, isn't it? It's all broken down and messed up. What, what, what do you when you do it when you're building something? Don't know what it is when you're building something? What's 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 the first thing that you do? What's the first thing you do when you're building something? Come on, we've got builders here. What's that? Yeah, dig your footings out. That's right. Yeah, you dig your footings out. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. What's that? Plan it, yeah, plan it out, yeah, plan it out, dig your footings, yeah. Foundations, yeah, lay foundations, yeah, it's brilliant, isn't it? That's, I mean, I could have done with a bit of that, a bit of a plan, a few footings and a foundations would, would have gone quite well. Wouldn't it? And that's how you start when you're rebuilding something. But notice, where does Nehemiah start? Where does he start the great rebuilding project? Does he start with footings or, or, or with plans or with foundations or bricks or cement or whatever it might be? Well, no, actually, he starts in prayer, doesn't he? This is striking. It struck me this week. He starts in prayer, and particularly as we see in verse 6, this is what he says, middle of verse 6, I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself, and my father's family have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly towards you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws you gave your servant Moses. Where does Nehemiah begin this great rebuilding project? Actually, he begins with confession and crying. That's how he starts, with confession and crying. And so should we. As God's people, as we begin, if you like, to rebuild life as a church family, so should we. 
This is where we need to start. We have to slow down. It's so tempting, isn't it? To, well, let's get the, the foundations in, get on with the footings, the plans, the, the, the bricks and mortar and all the rest of it. Now, actually, as we rebuild church life, the place we need to start is with confession and crying. See, Nehemiah, what's he sad about? Actually, he's sad about sin. He's sad about sin. He's sad about the sins of God's people, their, their disgrace, their shame. Yes, the walls as well, but mainly that. And that's what he prays, didn't it? Do you notice how he prays? He, he kind of prays, doesn't he? My sins, the sins of my family, my household, are the sins of God's people, the Israelites. And as we, as we rebuild church life, what we've got to do is slow down And start here with confession and crying. This is something actually for all of us, isn't it? For each one of us to to actually copy what Nehemiah does and go, look, my sins, the the, the sins of my household, and then the the sins of God's people as a whole. You know, what, what do I, as in me, what do I need to say sorry to God for? What do you, as an individual, what do you need to say sorry to God for? And then it goes out don't it, from there. Once we've done that, as a family, as a household, what, what do we need to confess to God and repent of? And then it goes on from there, doesn't it? As a church... As God's people, just like Nehemiah here, as a, as a church family, what do we need to confess and repent of? Uh, all over, all over this country and all over the world, there are different cultures, aren't there? there are all sorts of different cultures, and that's one of the wonderful thing, things about the way God's made us. We're diverse and different. Churches have cultures as well. Every church has its own culture. Uh, when God's word comes into contact with any culture, doesn't matter where it is or what it is. There will be things that it encourages. God encourages us. I do that more and more. That's great. And there will be other things that God's word confronts. What is that for us as as a body, as a whole? What do we need to confess and say sorry to God about? Nehemiah was sad about sin. And, you know, the Bible says, doesn't it, uh, Paul says this in, in, in 2 Corinthians, godly sorrow brings repentance. Actually, as we, we, we're really sad about our sin, like proper godly sorrow, that will lead to us repenting, turning away from that sin and turning back to Jesus and seeking to live differently. Nehemiah is sad about sin. Is there any hope in this Bible passage? It seems a bit negative, doesn't it, for a Sunday morning? But is there any hope here? Well, yes, I think there is. There are three things here, wonderful things. First of all, you see, don't you, a servant leader who prays? A servant leader who prays. Nehemiah, he calls himself a servant. He's a leader. And he prays for God's people. Does that remind you of anyone? Who should that remind us of? Go on, Marion. I, I can see it. It's on you. Jesus, yes. Yeah, Nehemiah points us forward to Jesus. He is the great servant leader, isn't he? He came not to be served, but to serve. And he prays for us constantly. That's wonderful, isn't it? There's more hope, not just a servant who prays, but a God who gathers. Did you see that there in the passage? Uh, This God who has promised, he says, look, if you return to me, then I will gather you from wherever you are. From the furthest, that you, no matter how far you've gone away from God, from the furthest horizon, I will gather you in, he says. That's true, isn't it? You only need to take that step of saying, I'm going to confess my sins to God. We're going to confess our sins to God as a household, as a people, as a church family. We take that one step of returning, of repenting, and he says, I will gather you back. I will bring you back. Wherever you've got to, you're never too far. I'll gather you back in. That's the second thing, a God who gathers. The third thing is help is at hand, isn't it? Help is at hand. Nehemiah's gone to King Artaxerxes, and there's just a 
There's just a hint that maybe help will come and the walls will be rebuilt. There's the hope, sure. But right now, we must slow down and we must stop here. We must be sad about sin. Godly sorrow leads to repentance. How have I sinned? How do I need to, what do I need to confess to God today? What about you? What about your family? What about us as a church family? Let's be sad about sin. You know, the building project starts here. Not bricks and mortar. Not foundations. Not even plans, prayer, confession, and crying. In fact, dare I say it, this is the foundation. This is the foundation of a work of God that we confess our sins and repent. Confession and crying, repentance, a response of sadness about our shameful sins. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we have disobeyed you. We have wronged you. We have acted wickedly. And Father, we do repent of our sins this morning. And we pray that in the days ahead, you would grant us godly sorrow. That you would grant us time to reflect on our own hearts, our own lives. Before we go anywhere else to just consider how we might be sad about sin. And how we might confess and repent and come back to you. Father, we thank you that you are this God who gathers. And we pray that you would gather us close to you in the days ahead. Help us to slow down, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen.